So, emergency planning and emergency management and disaster planning. Um, we know this is not the sexiest of topics, which is why I've got this nice, intimate little group in the room. I wish I had a full room because this is what absolutely everybody should know and what everybody should do. And I am just so blown away at the amount of people when I say to them, do you have an emergency plan? <coughs> Uh, do you plan for the different things that could happen? Well, yes, of course we do. No, they don't. They don't have a system for every single possible incident. And that's what I'm going to talk about today, is if you don't have a system for every potential incident, then something's going to happen. Something is going to happen that you haven't thought about. And what I want you to go with away from here today is with the, the tools and the resources so that if something happens at your property in the future, you've got, you're, you're able to manage it. Something happens, no problem. Bed bugs, no problem. Somebody gets locked out and they've left their keys in the house, no problem. A dog gets skunked on changeover day and then runs in the property runs round the property and jumps on every bed and every couch. You've got it handled. So that's what I want. These are all <laughs> things that happened last year. A tree falls on a guest's car and totals it. Three minutes after the guest moved away from his car, having taken groceries out of his, out of his um, I would say, boot of the car. Just to give you a couple of, of incidences, we had an incident two weeks ago. Uh, guests in a property down on a um, place called Port Stanley, which is on Lake Ontario. A couple with a dog. We don't get problems in April. We've probably got four families in properties at any one time. That's it. You know, we just do not have the... We don't have the turnover to get issues. But we get the call at 9 o'clock at night. We've just taken the dog out for a walk. And we've just come back and realized that we can't get in. We can't get in the door. No problem, we said. If you go to where the furnace is outside, where it's the, the air conditioning unit is outside, you just look underneath it, and there's a key, a spare key, hanging on a hook. Because we tell all our owners we must have spare keys. OK, that's great. Thanks very much. Five minutes later, and we, we hang on the phone. We, we don't let them. We, we don't sort of free them off then. There isn't an air conditioning unit. Oh, yes, there is. Yeah, yeah. you've obviously not looked properly. There's, there really is an air conditioning unit. No, there's not. He said, it looks like there's a, there's a patch of grass where there was an air conditioning unit. There is no more. So, OK, the owner's somehow, he's moved the air conditioning unit, which means the key's gone. So what do we do? We phone the owner. It's 9 o'clock at night. He's not answering his phone. We phone the property manager. The property manager, or the, the, um, the, the contact number we've got for the property man manager, puts us through to this guy on the other end of the phone who every time he picks up the phone, and he does keep picking it up every time we ring, and he says, I don't, take, I don't take anything but local calls, and puts the phone down. So we try ringing him again. He picks it up, and he says, I don't take long distance calls, and puts the phone down. <laughs> so here we are in a situation with this couple that is locked out of the house. They can see their keys, car keys, their home keys, on the table inside the house. And they cannot get in the door. And we say, oh, well, you're pressing the right buttons, and we went through every combination. We had, you know, it's a combination. It's usually set to the last four digits of the telephone number. That didn't work. That was the way they got themselves in. And <coughs> why is it not working now? So we have an emergency number. We tried that. That didn't work either. 
And he said, well, the door handle feels a bit loose. I think it's broken. So here we are, 9.30 now. People locked out. It's cold. They haven't, they're not wearing much. They've got a dog. Their car keys are inside, so they can't get in their car and drive home, which was an hour and a half away, which was, you know, OK, perhaps you go home and come back in the morning. No hotel will take them because they've got a dog. And what do you do? What do you do? We don't have a system for that. We do now. Because every time these things happen, you just put another process in place to deal with it. Um, Fortunately, I mean, my, my business partner, who lives two, and a half hour, uh, two hours away from this property, loaded his car with blankets and sleeping bags and food and hot beverages and was heading down there because these guests said they'd sleep on the porch until we got hold of the owner. I mean, there were other ways. He was actually going to break a window when he got there. He was going to get in somehow. And, you know, th there are no emergency locksmiths in that part of Ontario. You know, you can't just go get somebody to come out to a property at, at, <coughs> at 10 o'clock at night. It, it doesn't happen. He's half an hour out, and the owner contacts him. It's like, wow, here's the big sigh of relief. Um, the, owner went, the owner was 10 minutes away, went down there with his spare key, and let them in another door. So the, the skunk, that was one we had last summer, you know. Guests packing up, they've got doors open, dog goes outside. Skunk appears from out of underneath the deck, sprays the dog, the dog bolts back indoors, scoots around the house, is on every piece of furniture because the dog is totally freaked out. Um, we dealt with that one. Another one. Hot tub folliculitis. Anybody heard of that? We get, we've got 200 properties. A lot of them have hot tubs. We don't change, our hot tub water is not changed on each rental. We rely on our property managers to do due diligence in the, um, in the chemical management of a hot tub. But we also educate our guests in how to use a hot tub. Um, but we still get these hot tub folliculitis uh, complaints, usually when they get home and uh, their kid gets a rash, gets taken to the doctor, and oh, this, let's get some money back. So those are just a couple of um, examples. The other one, of course, is bed bugs, which I think Derek's already covered. <laughs> but we will, we'll, we'll, we're going to cover bed bugs too, because we had the bed bug incident, we, had the most, we have the most amazing process in place to deal with bed bugs. And that's because we've done what I'm going to talk about. So there's three steps to emergency management and disaster planning. And it's, we, we, we call it the, the preparation pyramid. Um, we start with self-preparation. It's preparation of the, uh, the property owner or the agency, all the staff, all the stakeholders. You get them prepared for potential emergencies and disasters first. You then make sure the property is prepared for every <coughs> eventuality. And finally, you make sure you have your guest preparation in place. And at some point here, we are going to come to Rex's um, <coughs> example, which is pretty extreme, um, and just talk a bit later on about you know, how you had all those those were well, all these parts of the prim, uh, uh, pyramid um, handled. So let's start with self-preparation. And this is where, this is the fun bit. And we've done this in our office. We actually took the whole staff out for a, half a day and we did our brainstorming. And we went off into a nice quiet space. We actually rented, well, we actually went to one of our, one of our, um, rental properties uh, as part of our annual meeting and we said okay we're going to spend half a day on emergency planning and we're going to touch on everything that we could possibly imagine and out of that meeting came all our processes so we started with okay let's go for categories environmental liability major system failure pandemic Let's not forget SARS that we had here. 2002? 
2002, 2003, SARS, does everybody remember this in Toronto? We had issues with properties up in cottage country where we had guests in place and the owners wanting to get the guests out because they wanted to get out of the city. And then we had people who wanted to rent properties because they wanted to get out of the city. It was, that was an interesting one. So when I'm saying pandemic, think SARS, Zika virus is the current one. You know, having systems in place to deal with those. And then administrative issues. Ever had a double booking? Anybody had a double booking? Yes. We've had, we've had issues of guests who didn't leave on the day they were meant to. They just went out for the day. So when our cleaning team arrived, all their stuff is there. And we've got get new guests going in in three hours. And they've gone because they thought they were checking out the following day. We've had people arriving a day early. So it's those things that um, you need to have plans in place for. So we've got a great list here. And that is the, that is the start. So this is how you need to do this, is sit down with your team. And your team could be your, your staff, your reservationists, your, um, your housekeepers, your maintenance people, all the stakeholders. If your stakeholders are simply you, your spouse, and, and the handyman guy down the road, well, that's who you have to get together to create this brainstormed list. Once you've got that list, the next part is to look at every, take out each thing that you've covered and think about. If this happens, the situation, the solution, then that happens. And the SOP, which is your standard operating procedure, that is what defines the steps you're going to take. And the goal is satisfaction under the circumstances, because not everybody's going to be happy. And in general, nobody's going to be happy. <laughs> Unless, of course, and, I, and I've, always, I've always adhered to this, is that a bad situation handled really, really well can bring you more loyal customers than no situation at all. Exactly. You know, is that old thing, a complaint is a gift. For each one of these, you've, you've defined your contingency and now you want to do your standard operating procedures and you have your key people involved. And I'm going to come to bed bugs because I think this is, uh, you know, this is one that we all may face at some time. Um, so you keep it, people involved. What are the health and safety issues involved? What equipment and supplies do you need? And the troubleshooting, because in actually on the way, you're going to run into issues. So you, you complete a standard operating procedure for each, each of these situations. So let's take bed bugs. And I'll tell you what happened when, when we had a bed bug situation. And, and then we can perhaps explore what Derek, what happened with Derek. Our bed bug plan, and we have, when you think we have 200 properties, they are scattered right the way across Ontario. So it's not one pest <coughs> controller we have to be in touch with. It's we have a list of pest controllers in every single area. And we don't want our pest controllers to be more than <coughs> 45 minutes from a property, which is, you know, that, that, that's quite a feat when you consider where our properties are. And some, they are a bit further. But we've been in contact with every one of these pest controllers, and we've asked them, what's your reaction time? If we call you and say, we've got a bed bug situation, what's your reaction time? How soon can you get somebody out? And some of them are sort of fly-by-night. That's, that's interesting for a pest controller. Fly-by-night companies <laughs> that, um, that, that are just saying, well, you know, su I suppose we could be there in, in four or five hours. No, I want 45 minutes. I want an hour. If somebody calls me and says, we've got bed bugs, somebody's got to go out and identify. what. That's the first thing. They have to go and identify what these bugs are. Nine times out of 10, they're not bed bugs at all. And, and we have deployed these pest controllers on a number of occasions over the past few years. 
And we called them up and said, you told us it was going to be 45 minutes reaction time. Can you get to this place? And they will send somebody. Fortunately, most of the pest control companies in Ontario, there's, 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 well, there's only a couple, and they're franchised out around the province. And, and they do mostly adhere to much the same standards. So we, we tend to go to those first. Miller Pest Control, they're pretty good. I don't know if you know that one, Ross. Bill's Pest Control. Bill's, yeah. It's in your area. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's several around and about. So you identify those, you contact them, you find out their um, reaction time. So that's the first thing you get somebody in to identify if it is a bed bug or not. If it is, the second part of the standard operating procedure comes into effect. Call the owner. Get in touch with the owner. Tell him he's got an issue. The issue, of course, with bed bugs is you don't know how they got there. It could have been the previous guests. It could have been these guests have brought them in. And then in the one case we had, the, the uh, pest controller said, we're not finding bed bug feces anywhere. You know, we just found a couple of these bugs but no feces, so you know, they could have just come in. But you cannot <laughs> prove it. You can't prove it. And the pest control has gone in and said there is a bed bug situation. What we can do is talk to the owner and say, it looks like they were brought in by these guests, but we can't prove it. So the next thing is, the next part of the procedure is, and we know this, we have to, we ha have to relocate the guests. But in order to do that, because we're putting them in another property, we have to make sure that they're not carrying the bed bugs with them. Um, and that gets into a very personal situation because they, we have to launder all their, all their clothes have to be laundered. We have to dispose, we disposed of their luggage. We bought them new luggage. We sent them out shopping. They bought their new luggage. We sent them to the laundromat. They did their, their own. I mean, these, these were very, very nice guests. I don't know whether it would happen again, but this was, this was <coughs> the system. We could have sent somebody up to do this for them, or they could have gone home. Um, we know what we're doing in the way of refunds and rebates. We know who's paying for what. We're not standing there going, oh my god, bed bugs, what do we do? Because the standard operating procedure is there, and anybody if I'm at a conference and somebody's got this issue back in the office, even our girl in the Philippines knows how to put this plan into action. And this is the same. So we, we're just talking one, um, one situation that, that perhaps we brainstorm. And you put your standard operating procedure in place for it. So you need to make sure you know who your key people are and let them know. You find out what their reaction time is. If, if one of your situations is a, the, the water pump breaks down, your key person is a plumber. You need to know what their reaction time is. Are they going to be straight out there? In, in our areas, plumbers rule the roost because there's very few of them. So many plumbers won't deal with people who aren't their customers if it's a weekend or a, or a holiday or an evening. They may have a 24-hour service, but it's only for their existing customers, and they won't, call, they won't get called out for anybody else. So it's knowing those things. that You can't just pick a plumber out of, of, of Google and put his name down, and we'll call him because he says he's got a 24-hour service, to then to find that he's not going to come out because it's not an existing customer. So that's something else you've got to feed in to your SOP. Along those lines, the, the very first thing on SOP, when it comes to vacation rentals, um, having a doc good documentation about where your shutoffs are for all major systems first. That's great, great. Because it yeah. may be a while before your plumber gets there, so where is your water, sh water shut off at the street? And then hopefully, maybe if you're lucky, the house itself has a water sh shut off for the house that's not at the street, so you can isolate the, uh, the issue. So. Yeah. Absolutely, and we perhaps put that in the sort of troubleshooting um, or even the health and safety category. Um, making sure you've got equipment and supplies in place for, for the skunk. All our property, we, we ask all our owners to have a skunk kit in place. It's really for, for pets. If, some, if a pet gets skunked outside, then there is a kit that contains hydrogen peroxide, uh, hydrogen peroxide, 
dawn and bicarbonate of soda, a bucket and a pair of rubber gloves because that's what takes a skunk smell off a dog, not tomato juice. So that, that's just part of how we educate our owners and say, this is what we have to have in your emergency pack, and I'm going to come to that in a, in a minute. Um, the one when we got the skunk in the house, we were able to get an emergency cleaning service out, and the housekeeper was dispatched off to, um, to Walmart to, just to find new, a new rug for the floor. Fortunately, fortunately, it was, it was a wooden floor. It was a, a wood floor and not carpet. Um, by the time the new guests arrived, the smell was just about gone because they had leapt into action according to the SOP. So for every one of your... Um, of the situations that come up on your brainstorm, you then put a standard operating procedure in place for it. Okay? Moving along to the next part of the pyramid, which is property preparation. Because you need to have things in place should things break down. Um, I was at a property in Eleuthera um, February, and the power goes out a lot, and they don't have a generator. You know, this is. I would encourage everybody who's renting anything, where in, a, in anywhere where there's a likelihood of uh, power outages, have an automatic generator. We have a couple of properties that have gas-powered pull generators. Like no, because you can imagine you've got a group in a property. It's nine o'clock at night. They've had four or five beers. The power goes out and somebody goes, yeah, I'm going outside for a smoke, so I'll just light up the generator just to make sure we got some power. Probably not the best idea. So you know, we encourage all our owners to get automatic generators. A lot of money, but you get that back in certainly in Ontario because we can have power outages in cottage country that last for days. And people don't, people cancel, they leave, they get refunds. So over time, a generator will pay for itself in people not having to go home. So we went to Eleuthera, power went out, and they had some of these. Just these little, not candles, please no candles, just these um, little lighting things. Absolutely wonderful. You, have you all got these? Something like this? Yeah. And have it really ha handy. Are you leaving for good? <laughs> um, so that's, that's a, a, a great thing to have. Um, so we have in, in our properties, you probably don't need them. Just the crank radio, or this is a, just a battery-powered radio. This is, my, this is the um, power outage kit that we have. In here, we also have garbage bags, rubber gloves. We always have a pack of, um, what do you call them, power bars in there. Because we've had power outages where trees have come down on roads, and people haven't get, been able to get out for two days. So we have water, we have power bars. You know, unfortunately, guys, we, you know, we, you know when, when I'm talking to, to, to guests, if, if I was talking to guests, I'd, I'd just go, oh, unfortunately, guys, you know, we can't feed you for two days, we're not giving you all the food, but you've got some power bars, they'll keep you going, but we do our utmost to get, um, get stuff in. We've taken, we have taken food and water into guests on snowmobiles in the winter. Of course it would be in the winter if it was on a snowmobile. It was but an and I had an SOP. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't feel that. <laughs> um, things like, you know, wet wipes. Because, you know, if, you, if you've got a property on a septic system or on, on a water pump, then when that, uh, when that power goes out, you can't flush toilets and, and it all gets a little bit, you know, you, you really don't want to start piling stuff. I'm, I'm not going to go any further since we've just been talking about bathroom breaks. 
But as part of your, um, part of your property preparation, really important to do checks, regular audits. One of, um, I talked to a bed bug expert on the podcast a while back, and, and he gave me some fabulous advice on there. And you know, this, this was about liability, really. He said, if it comes to court and you can show, you have it documented that you do a regular monthly check of your property, how much better is that than to say, oh, I've never checked for bed bugs? It may not carry, but you have that check in place. Um, so he was, he was suggesting that everybody has a, a form that their caretaker fills in at the end of every, once a month to go round the property and, and follow a set procedure to look for bed bugs. And um, I should give you, I, I don't have that site um, in my head, but if you go to cottageblogger.com, and go to the and just go into the search bar bed bugs that will bring up that podcast and in the show notes are um, links to his website which have some amazing videos on how to do bed bug checks does this is exciting isn't it um, the other with hot tubs you know we're talking about hot tub folliculitis the reason that people get hot tub folliculitis when they're on vacation is not because the owner has been negligent about the hygiene of his hot tub, because we've had these reports when people have gone into properties where the water has just been t changed, and it was, and the owner said, we just changed the water. It was perfectly balanced. But the whole group has been in that hot tub four hours a day, five days of the week, and the kids have been jumping in and out. They've been eating food in it. They've been doing whatever else in it. And as they leave, you might get the phone call to say, well, the hot tub's not very nice. It smells a bit. Because maybe the owner hasn't given the guests the instructions on how to, uh, to, to manage the hot tub. Of course, in some places, you have people that go and do hot tubs for you. It's not possible in some areas. And you have the guests have to self-manage. So we're going to come to that in a second. But one of the audits is to ensure that you have a piece of paper in your welcome book or somewhere. It's a bit like the bathroom checks in hotels and you know, in the restrooms when it says this property was checked at such and such a time and a signature. And that's what you need for your hot tubs is, is a form that your housekeeper can complete on every changeover to say that hot tub has been checked, what chemicals have been added, whether there was a filter check. Well, we, we change our filters on every changeover. So the filter was changed, the chemical balance was checked, these were the readings, and, every, and they're signing to say everything was balanced at that time. That is your, what would you call it? It's, it's your proof. Hmm? CYA. <laughs> Which is? To cover your... Oh. <laughs> well, yes, it's your CYA. Um, it, it is, it is... Can you articulate? Yeah, can you articulate that? <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so, so that's what you do for, for your hot tub. And just, you know, it is, it is covering yourself in case of some sort of claim. Um, you do safety audits. And this is so important with, you know, the, t the times that I've, I've actually been to uh, do an annual visit to a property, which we do every year. We can't do much more than annual visits to our properties to find that, that there is not a single smoke alarm with a battery in it. And I always go in and I test every one. There's no battery in there. Oh, yeah, the guests must have taken it out. When did that happen? Well, I don't know. I, mean, I want those smoke alarms tested every single changeover because people take batteries out all the time. They, they burn toast and the alarm goes off. They take the battery out and they think, oh, I don't really want that to go off again. It's too annoying. So they put it back without the battery. So the safety, you, know, you need to have safety audits in place that are 
weekly, on changeovers, perhaps monthly, but don't leave it until the clocks change to check the smoke alarm, batteries. Um, same with CO monitors. But making sure they have them, making sure they have fire extinguishers in the right places. I went to one place where I was looking around and I, I always checked, so where's your fire extinguisher? It's in the closet. And I opened the closet and the fire extinguisher is still in the box it came in. So, and I said, why haven't you got it out? Put it by the door because that's where it should be. Um, well, it, 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 it looks unsightly. And yeah, it, uh, having a son who is a firefighter, if you didn't know, that's what Mike's full-time job is, is um, firefighting. He is so hot on this, st hot on this stuff. <sighs> he, he is. <laughs> so, you know, he wants, he, he, he tells me every time, did you check? Did you check? when you went out there, did you check fire extinguisher? It's in a place where they can get at it. It's been, it's not, it wasn't bought in 1968. It's, it, it's up to date. It's, and there are smoke alarms. There's carbon monoxide monitors. Make sure those are in place. So that's just, that's just safety audit. But that one about batteries in a smoke alarm, um, I, I think is, is, is something everybody should should really think about because they do take them out. Can I just bite everybody in this room? That's um, can you? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Mightn't apply to everybody in this room, but it's something that does apply here in Ontario. Uh, what do you recommend to your clients regarding life jackets? <coughs> we have a particular protocol for, for life jackets for our owners. And we say if you're providing a boat, you need to provide life jackets because if there's no life jackets, and you may correct me on this, if there's no life jackets and they go out in that boat and something happens, <coughs> well, nobody told them to wear a life jacket and there wasn't one anyway. So we say you must supply life jackets and you must supply the boat safety kits. However, on the information that we give to our guests, we say that there are some adult life jackets provided. <coughs> However, it is, in, it is your responsibility to ensure that they, are, that they fit correctly. You do not use adult life jackets on children, and if you have children, you must bring your own. Okay? Oh, no. ten, 10 out of 10? The, uh, the big thing with life jackets, as you said, is uh, fit. And uh, the uh, adult life jackets, uh, generally speaking, are going to be safe for most adults but when you get into children yeah. you've got a big problem and even suggesting there's a life jacket in the property for a child mm -hmm. is uh, tantamount <coughs> to because the life jacket has to fit the child yeah. properly yeah we, we we don't want child life jackets and we're often asked as as you know <coughs> a guest guests will ask us what do you have any child life jackets and, and i was because the owners will leave them and i say i we we do they do supply some adults, adult life jackets. You must bring your own for the children to make sure they fit correctly. So, um, Appliance operations. Um, make sure you do your regular <coughs> audits on all your appliances. Um, I mean, that, that, that goes without saying to make sure. And this is on changeover. Run something, you know, run the, 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 the mug of water through the... Uh, it's, on our, it's on our changeover checklist for our housekeepers. Put that mug of water in the microwave and make sure the microwave's working. Not only on changeover, um, but also when the property signs on. Yes. Because and that may seem uh, overkill, but I've had brand new properties, and these are condos. They're not, but some somebody did something wrong. Um, actually, the most recent case, it was uh, the our client redid their countertop, and the and the contractor did not plug the range back in, they shoved it back there, but they didn't plug it in. So then the guest comes and no, uh, the, the oven doesn't work. That, that's a great point because so I, I don't think so, I've So done have that. a checklist after work gets done based off of yeah. a, after what needs to get done, so. Good, fantastic, love it.
So yeah, you know, every appliance needs to be checked. Um, if you're if you're a, a, a property manager, then on on take on, or it's part of the onboarding process. Um, but but your own property, I I get um, and I include light bulbs. My housekeeper has to switch on and off every single light bulb. It's part. They go into a room, light bulbs. First thing, lights on, lights off. Just to check. I mean, we have light bulbs there, but we are finding more and more that we get the call saying, can somebody come and change the light bulb for me? And I'm not sending somebody 35 kilometers down a road to change a light bulb. I'm sorry. It, it just, and we have this expression like, cottage rental is not for you. If, but we're finding people are more needy, even in Ontario, where we've always been very, very self-reliant. And, you know, because most of us who, who go to cottages in, in our part of the world, used to go camping. You know, they remember the camping under the stars and, and the old days of cottages where you cleared the mice, mouse poop out of the drawers before you put anything in there. And, and you didn't have an indoor toilet. You know, it was a little outhouse, which was usually precariously situated on a rock. You know, that's what we used to have. So indoor toilets and, and the TV with the rabbit ears was just like huge luxury. Now, what's luxury? There is... You know, no HBO, Yes. Yeah. Yeah. High-speed yes. internet? What? Well, high-speed internet is, is the thing. Somebody said to us recently, high did, don't you know that unlimited internet is as, as um, important to me as water? And that, hmm. scary. it is scary, but that's, that's the way it is. And you know, it is what it is. And we have to adapt to, uh, to meet that. Um, regular audits of the pro property exterior. Um, and we are so hot on this because of, we, we have decks, we have docks, loads of wood that rots. Loads of wood that have, I'm sure you know, Ross, <coughs> that nails come out of. Um, people have trees taken down and they forget they've got these huge stumps and then they allow foliage to grow up around the stumps. So people don't know, it just looks like a little bush and they run into it and then you've got a broken ankle and nobody told them. Um, leaves on steps. We, we did have a claim from a guest about wet leaves on stone steps. His mother-in-law tripped um, sprained her ankle going down to the property. She slipped on some wet leaves. Toronto, of course, is a city that experiences the winter, ice and snow, uh, particularly ice in this, in this part of the world. Um, we will pay claims to a woman stepping out of her car in high heels, spike heels, who does, has a trip and fall in the parking lot. We can't escape the claim. It may be diminished because she is contributory. That's the key word, is contributory. But we're going to end up paying something. So the, uh, the, the exposures you have um, as, a, uh, as a manager uh, or a rental, uh, rental manager or a rental unit owner or whatever are, are endless. And, uh, Another thing that I did mention or talk to Heather about at the Cottage Life show, if you manage a number of different properties and a particular client comes to you and says, well, I have this particular special need, which property would you recommend? If you make a recommendation for them to stay at a property and something goes wrong, you're wearing it. You have no way out. And that, I mean, we, do, we are asked this all the time. Is this property child friendly? And I think that's, a, that's an example of that. Is this property child friendly? We have a stock answer to that. We don't know your children. We don't know what your needs are. You can ask us about specific items, facilities, amenities, but we can make no comment about whether a property is child friendly. I have a question for you on that then, because I our stock answer to that is our properties are family friendly, but we do not claim for them to be child friendly or child proof. What do you think about that as a canned answer? Who's to say they're family friendly? 
as soon as you say they're family friendly and something happens that really is not a family friendly situation, you're wearing it. Uh, the client says to you, I've got uh, uh, a degenerative disease of some type that might affect their mobility. And uh, they say, will this property be suitable for me? And you say, oh, sure, perfect, no problem. And it proves to be a problem for that person with the mobility issue. Again, you're wearing it. Thank you. As ever, Ross, you're always the bearer of wonderful tidings. I, yeah. OK, your, your checklists. You have monthly ones on changeover. You have biannual ones and annual ones. So you're getting a large portfolio now of systems. And I'm just going to plug that in. <coughs> Excuse me. OK. So your property's all prepared. We looked at the emergency kit. So um, this, this emergency kit, I asked my, my owners to put together for every property. Um, it's peculiar to us because we have so many power outages. So I want to, you know, <coughs> I'll just tell you a little story here. And this, this, was not a, this was not a rental property, but it was something that really frightened me so much. It was my neighbor who told me the story. And they, they lived in a massive, massive, really big house on the lake. It was just gorgeous. He cooked a lot. They also drank a lot. They liked their wine. And he told me the story about one evening. They'd been just about to get, um, get dinner prepared, and the power went out. And they'd had a few glasses of wine, so they decided that, oh, whatever. We'll forget food. We'll just go to bed. They woke up maybe an hour later to a smoke-filled house because they'd left a pan with oil on it on the, on the stove. And it had been, I guess it had been on a low heat, I don't know, but it took about 45 minutes an hour before they woke up. And they were able to, to, to deal with it. I mean, they, they had to have a full redecoration because it was black smoke. And, and it just... It's one of these things that could happen so easily because you've got, you know, you've got guests in a property that is unfamiliar to them. So unfamiliarity makes them do things or do not do things that they would at home. So when a pa the power goes out, they have this immediate little panic. You know, I, I'm not familiar with where everything is. And if they don't have a lamp or they don't have the wherewithal to, to reorient themselves. And of course, they may, may be drinking. They may have had a ton to drink, and they're heading off, and they just head off to bed. <coughs> so, um, so we we supply the emergency pack, and we also supply. We also put a laminated sheet at the beginning of our um, our welcome books that says, "In the event of a power outage, this is what you must do. These are the first things you do." And when we call them, because we call all our guests, or the owners call the guests. They ask them, we ask them to make sure that they read. If they don't read anything else, and we know we don't, they don't read anything, just that front page that says, important, I mean, even so, you know, people don't even read that either, but we've done, I think, our due diligence, because we've said it in a couple of places that you need to read this. And it says, in the event of a power outage, this is what you do. We have a power outage pack. It has the lamps. There is a lamp. In a, we put them in different places. You can go and open this box. It will have everything you need. And then there is another sheet that says, and this is what you, you must call this number, and just, just a few other things. But it's in the event of a power outage. This is what you must do. And when we call them, we say, have you read this? What we should do is record those calls when they say, yeah, of course I have. Question for you, since we're based off of what you said. <laughs> but it triggered when you said it has everything you need in it. That might yeah, be well, something that you should I probably be don't about. say everything you need, but it's a, you know it's a power outage pack. Yeah, it has I, I, items. I just uh, it's got me thinking yeah. because of what well, yeah. said. So. Words, words. Yeah. So, so that's you know. Let's go to the the third part of the uh, the pyramid, which is guest preparation. I think we sort of alluded to that just with with 
what we what what I said there. Um, you don't want to you don't want to really scare them with this long list of if this happens then then you do this if that happens then you do this if you get bed bugs then you do this um, if the if the septic system overflows you do this well we try not to worry them but we we make sure that they've got the information they need to deal with a situation should it arise we do this with our pre-arrival documents and for everybody it's going to be um, it's going to be unique to you so for us we send them if they we have guests coming in the winter we send them what we call the winter wise document and you know Ross saying what he just did about somebody getting out of a of a car in in stiletto heels in tiny heels we have people coming up to cottage country in the winter they're leaving the city and there's no snow an hour north an hour and a half north we could be in six feet of the stuff and we so we have to tell them we have to ex explain this to them we've had people asking about fishing in February they want to go fishing they can, where, where can they rent a boat they don't have a clue about what life is like an hour and a half north of here so we give them this document it says you know if you're going down and, and each one is particular to a cottage some properties we they must have four-wheel drive we require all our guests to have winter tires if they're going to venture into cottage country we tell them to put this to put a blanket in the in the vehicle to make sure they've got winter clothes and it sounds it sounds so obvious but sometimes we've had people we, we we've stopped people or some we had somebody who broke down on the road down to my cottage well in fact they, they didn't break down they drove themselves into a snowdrift and and called us my husband went down and this lady had leaned out of the car and she said oh, I can't get out she said, I haven't got a coat and it's like this is February in Ontario and you don't have a coat oh yeah she had a jacket you know a, a sort of light jacket and she said well we we we're not going to go out we're having a romantic weekend so we chose this cottage that had this fireplace and uh, she said, it's got a hot tub, but she said, I'm not gonna be wearing anything at all when I go from the house to the hot tub. That's fine, that's too much information. However, you are serious, you don't have a coat. No coat, no hat, no gloves, no scarf. Because it was nice and warm in the car and she was only gonna run from the, from the car to the house. And then they broke down in a snow drift on a country road with one bar on the cell phone they were very lucky to get hold of us down there and if, if you know if the car had run out of fuel and they'd had to walk she would have been she would have been dead so we we warn our guests what it's like so never ever and i'm sure i you know i'm preaching probably preaching to the converted here but don't ever assume that anyone knows anything about anything <laughs> because in, you know, in many cases they don't. In the welcome book, what I just said was, you know, put something at the front, because that's probably the only thing they're going to read. I mean, you might use something like, um, you know, an, an app. I think you know, we don't use. We, we're still not using using apps because many of our areas don't still don't have cell signals, so we still we still rely on paper. Um, so, you know, we we still do welcome books. So we put something at the front I ask my owners to put a laminated sheet on the inside of the cupboard that is most often used so it's usually a food cupboard because that's going to be opened and as they open the door there is this thing that says in the event of an emergency this is what you do I have a question for you because I've been dealing with this recently um, welcome how often do you check the welcome books because we've been having them walk away part of our cha of our checklist Month, is it, do you do monthly like do you, is that part of your monthly i'm just change curious over. it's on changeover. changeover it's part of the changeover checklist yeah. is to check the welcome book so because I, people I'm tear pages out of it you know if, if it's got if if it's if it's we we have some people who who create these books on blurb so they're bound it's really really nice but then somebody will tear a page out of it if it's got the restaurants on it 
and they're going out. So, yeah, we, we check on every, every changeover. Just part of the checklist. It only takes 30 seconds, if that. Um, we do blog posts and newsletters. So that's where we can, we can give information in a, in a sort of non-threatening way. So we'll send a blog, we'll, we'll, I'll write a blog post about black fly. You are very lucky, folks, because this week is the start of black fly season. Uh, you don't get much black fly down here in the city, but certainly up in cottage country, it's, uh, we have about, uh, depends, it could be 10 days, it could be two weeks, it could be three weeks of evil bugs. And these are not mosquitoes, these are the nasty little things that draw blood when they bite you. They have little incisors that sort of, and they go for the neck. The only the first time you know you've been bitten by a black fly is you do that and you're covered in blood. Um, just so I share that one. But I might do a blog post on, on black fly. You know, if you're coming up at this time of year, this is how you avoid them. And there are ways um, using DEET. And then we do an in the event of document. And we do have in the event of all these things that could possibly go wrong. But we usually put it in somewhere tucked away and then draw their attention to it in the event of an emergency. At this point, Rex, will you tell, take the mic and tell us your story? I'd love to know what the story was about how you prepared your guests for what occurred. So you need to... So let me set the scene a bit. Um, Can you put that up oh, to there? So we're about uh, two hours southwest of Melbourne on the coast in a rainforest, or a rainforest on the, on the beach. And it's a similar circumstance to California where you get these long, hot, drying winds and um, the vegetation gets um, very dried out and very volatile, so it can get um, almost tinder, tinder dry. And um, there was an event seven years ago where uh, there was a fire um, and uh, a lot of people left at the last minute and 175 people died um, from one event. Um, so that was real close to the home. And about 70% of those people die as they leave at the last minute. So uh, our issue is to, in a little village of about um, 50 or 60 rental houses, is to have the owners aware that they should either leave early or go to the beach but not hang around in the house and not panic and try and drive through a, a, a wildfire. So people were pretty sensitised to that and uh, we expect to have the power go out so there's no water supply, there's no uh, water um, facilities. We only have one cell phone company so that people will have four different kinds of telephones but only one will work. So people will not have cell phone reception to know that there's a problem or to be in, in communication in one house we had no Wi-Fi, um, so people couldn't get onto the thing. Well, there's an optional Wi-Fi, but most people say, I'm here for a holiday, I don't want it. And there is, however, a, a, an, an app which will alert people if there's something happening. So we also give people a knapsack, uh, which has blankets and um, uh, transistor radio, some water, some hat, sunscreen to go down to the beach. So pe people have that. And then... Um, the idea is to get them out if there's a potential of a fire. On the five days before Christmas, there was a lightning strike into a ravine, and it was too hard for the firefighters to get to it. So they said, it's OK, we're just watching it, don't worry about it, have a good holiday, um, see you later. So based on that, we went to Christmas, leaving our guests in the houses. But before we left, we said to our guests, um, there is a fire several kilometres away. Um, and just make sure you have this app on at all times. So we had a loan phone for those that didn't have the, uh, the right cell phone frequency, and we, ha we just opened up the Wi-Fi system that we have, say, use it, forget about the money, just use it, hang on to the, look at the app and so on. And uh, 11 o'clock on Christmas Day, the wind was abnormally fierce, whipped the um, embers out of the, the ravine, up into the hill, the helicopter, helicopters were watching, the app goes off, whoop, 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 and so uh, stop, call the first set of guests saying, 
okay, there is a fire on the way. Remember we talked about this, so we talked about the guests beforehand. Because um, we don't want those guests dead. That's the, the big thing. <laughs> <laughs> that's very thoughtful. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's a bad outcome. Um, so uh, we have the conversation. Remember we had the discussion, get the dog, and the th things out now. Can we pack up? Can we just get everything? No, don't pack anything. Go straight to the house. We'll cover anything. If there's a problem, just go. And then we said the same to the other property that we had. And the same conversation. Just leave everything, get in the car, and go. And they, they went out. That happened through all, all through the village. And then that day, uh, 116 houses were burned in that village. And about 200 were not burned, of which our residents um, survived. So that was really good. But our other uh, rainforest house, exposed house, uh, perished. So um, in some ways, it was a bad outcome. But in, in another way, it was a good outcome. Afterwards comes a lot of surprises. So you then start thinking, now, my friend Ross, who I've insured with, how much have I really insured with? Was it a lot or not? And there were 10% uh, of people who were not insured at all, um, which is quite a problem. Probably 50% underinsured because it's quite difficult with new fire regulations. And luckily, my wife had uh, upped the insurance by 200,000 um, two weeks before the fire, which is. Um, very fortuitous, which is nice. Um, so then you go through the whole thing about insurance. How much do you have for the structure, for the contents, for the loss of rental? And in our neck of the woods, um, we are responsible if the place is not, not available and all the guests cancelled, even though we're available in a, you know, a little while after. They just said, I don't want to come to your area. But we take that on the chin, refund all the money, and um, the insurance was pretty good with most of those things. But the guests who left uh, in the house that was burned down, uh, they left um, $8,000 worth of gear, um, a me medical machine, new, new clothes and so on. In another property, $40,000 worth of gadgets, um, laptops or paraphernalia. And so we just didn't think that you could um, need to provide for your guests' uh, possessions. Because if I say, you go now and we'll cover you, um, then I cover you. I'm, I'm, it's me. So you know, we were pretty close. I think I think we had to pay um, about half of the eight thousand dollars or all of the eight thousand dollars out of our pocket, but that wasn't a problem. And we were in in a, in a good shape. But there were so many people that were underinsured, and now some of their lives are wrecked. Marriages are breaking up. Um, and the other thing that happens in a little village, which is a bit hard to provide for is that a lot of people who weren't actually there during the event but come back to see ashes suffer post-traumatic stress and they go into depression, they go, uh, I'm not sure, high and low. Um, and depression. Yeah, manic depression, yep. all, all those kind of things. So insurance you tend to underestimate because some people, for some people insurance was how little can I pay and how can I minimise my cost? Well, that's a bad strategy. And um, it's a salutary lesson, I think, to a lot of um, owners that you need to perhaps over-insure rather than under-insure. Um, and um, the after the event, efforts are just huge. So, Thank you. Thank you very much, Rex. And as I said you know, before, you know, that, that's, that's such a sad story. But I, I know you're, you're so... Um, just pragmatic about it, and yeah, it is what it is, and uh, that's uh, that. That just you know, the fact that you had prepared, you got these, you put these preparations um, in place. So, so really, that that wraps it up.